High-resolution satellite images have verified descriptions in the Rig Veda of the descent of the ancient Saraswati River from its source in the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Pure in her course from the mountains to the ocean, alone of streams, Saraswati hath listened. The mighty Saraswati River and its civilization are referred to in the Rig Veda more than fifty times, proving that the drying up of the Saraswati River was subsequent to the origin of the Rig Veda, pushing this date of origin further back into antiquity, casting further doubt on the imaginary date for the so-called Aryan invasion. This satellite image clearly shows the Indus Saraswati River system extending from the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Here, the Indus River is on the left, outlined in blue, while the Saraswati River Basin is outlined in green. The black dots are the many archaeological sites or previous settlements along the banks of the now dry Saraswati River. The drying up of the Saraswati River around 1900 BCE is confirmed archaeologically. Following major tectonic movements or plate shifts in the Earth's crust, the primary cause of this drying up was due to the capture of the Saraswati River's main tributaries, the Sutlej and the Dristadvati by other rivers. Although early studies based on limited archaeological evidence produced contradictory conclusions, recent independent studies, such as that of archaeologist James Schaffer in 1993, showed no evidence of a foreign invasion in the Indus Saraswat civilization and that a cultural continuity could be traced back for millennia. In other words, archaeology does not support the Aryan invasion theory. Marine archaeology has also been utilized in India off the coast of the ancient port city of Dwarka in Gujarat, uncovering further evidence in support of statements in the Vedic scriptures. An entire submerged city at Dwarka, the ancient port city of Lord Krishna, with its massive fort walls, piers, wharves, and jetty, has been found in the ocean as described in the Mahabharat and other Vedic literatures. This Sanskrit verse from the Moshala Parva of the Mahabharat describes the disappearance of the city of Dwarka into the sea. After all the people had set out, the ocean flooded Dwarka, which still teemed with wealth of every kind. Whatever portion of land was passed over, the ocean immediately flooded over with its waters. Dr. S. R. Rao, formerly of the Archaeological Survey of India, has pioneered marine archaeology in India. Marine archaeological findings seem to corroborate descriptions in the Mahabharat of Dwarka as a large, well-fortified, and prosperous port city, which was built on land reclaimed from the sea and later taken back by the sea. This lowering and raising of the sea level during these same time periods of the 15th and 16th centuries BCE is also documented in historical records of the country of Bahrain. Here is a glimpse of the massive Dwarka city wall. Among the extensive underwater discoveries were a large door socket and a bastion from the fort wall. Two rock-cut slipways of varying width extending from the beach to the intertidal zone, a natural harbor, as well as a number of olden stone ship anchors were discovered attesting to Dwarka being an ancient port city. The three-headed motif on this conch shell seal found in the Dwarka excavations corroborates the reference in the scripture Harivamsa that every citizen of Dwarka should carry a mudra or seal of this type. All these underwater excavations add further credibility to the validity of the historical statements found in the Vedic literatures. Apart from Dwarka, 
more than 35 sites in North India have yielded archaeological evidence and have been identified as ancient cities described in the Mahabharat. Copper utensils, iron, seals, gold, and silver ornaments, terracotta discs, and painted grayware pottery have all been found in these sites. Scientific dating of these artifacts again corresponds to the non-Aryan invasion model of Indian antiquity. Furthermore, the Matsya and Vayu Puranas describe great flooding which destroyed the capital city of Hastinapur, forcing its inhabitants to relocate in Koshambi. The soil of Hastinapur reveals proof of this flooding. Archaeological evidence of the new capital of Koshambi has recently been found which has been dated to the time period just after this flood. Similarly, in Kurukshetra, the scene of the great Mahabharat war, iron arrows and spearheads have been excavated and dated by thermoluminescence to 2800 BCE, the approximate date of the war given within the Mahabharat itself. The Mahabharat also describes three cities given to the Pandavas, the heroes of the Mahabharat, after their exile. Paniprastha, Sonaprastha, and Indraprastha, which is Delhi's Puranakela. These sites have been identified and yielded pottery and antiquities, which show a cultural consistency and dating consistent for the Mahabharat period. Again, verifying statements recorded in the Vedic literatures. Although early Indologists in their missionary zeal widely vilified the Vedas as primitive mythology, many of the world's greatest thinkers admired the Vedas as great repositories of advanced knowledge and high thinking. Arthur Schopenhauer, the famed German philosopher and writer, wrote, that I encounter in the Vedas deep, original, lofty thoughts suffused with a high and holy seriousness. The well-known early American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson read the Vedas daily. Emerson wrote, I owed a magnificent day to the Bhagavad Gita. Henry David Thoreau said, In the morning, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seems puny and trivial. So great were Emerson and Thoreau's appreciation of Vedantic literatures that they became known as the American Transcendentalists. Their writings contain many thoughts from Vedic philosophy. Other famous personalities who spoke of the greatness of the Vedas were Alfred North Whitehead, British mathematician, logician, and philosopher who stated that Vedanta is the most impressive metaphysics the human mind has conceived. Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the principal developer of the atomic bomb, stated that the Vedas are the greatest privilege of this century. During the explosion of the first atomic bomb, Oppenheimer quoted several Bhagavad Gita verses from the 11th chapter, such as, Death I am, cause of destruction of the worlds. When Oppenheimer was asked if this is the first nuclear explosion, he significantly replied, Yes, in modern times implying that ancient nuclear explosions may have previously occurred. Lin Yutang, Chinese scholar and author, wrote, India was China's teacher in trigonometry, quadratic equations, grammar, phonetics, and so forth.